Hello and welcome to today's webinar. What is marketing and why do we need it? Today we will be discussing how the worlds of sales and marketing are changing and how you can learn to adapt in order to compete. So let's get started. I would now like to welcome our presenter for today, Peter Strawcob from Peter Strawcob Consulting. Peter is a hands-on sales and marketing professional with over 20 years sales and marketing management experience. He is the CEO of Peter Strawcob Consulting International, a business consulting firm specialising in lifting sales results in large organisations by working with their C-level executives and sales and marketing leaders to help their teams work work more effectively together. So we definitely have the expert here today and without any further ado, I'd like it like to hand it over to the lovely Peter. How are you? Yeah, good morning Sarah. Good morning everybody. Great to have you here and uh, great to see um, people from Queensland and from Victoria coming in and uh, hopefully throughout the session we'll get some more people from Sydney to join me as well. The um, thing I've been told I need to do in my webinars, the first thing is to have an agenda. <laughs> now, I, I always thought people didn't want agendas because they're boring, but I've been told I have to have one. So here it is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about me, um, changes over time, what the problem looks like, what a solution could be, what's in it for you, um, next steps, and then we'll have a special prize and then I'll say thank you and we'll have a bit of Q&A. So that was painless, wasn't it? <laughs> I'll just move on to that. So a little bit about me. Now, I've spent more than 15 years in uh, either sales or marketing roles in some of the largest organizations on the planet. So you can see Sony, CSC, 3M and, and Canon um, predominantly um, in the B2B space um, for me. And, and the thing that I've seen continuously is that um, sales and marketing teams don't really work as well together as, as they could. And uh, there's a wonderful phrase that a, a CEO of a, um, an Australian IT company gave me and uh, he's uh, allowed me to use it and that is there's a gap between sales and marketing the larger the organization, the larger the gap. And, and that seems to be really true. And, um, and that's kind of fired the passion in me to, to do something about it. And I've um, developed something called the One Team Method. Now, down the bottom right there, you can see there's a book. I'm very happy to say that uh, there'll be a book launch uh, next Wednesday in, in Sydney and there'll be free drinks and food. So if you happen to be in Sydney, come <laughs> and join me for the book launch. It'll be at the Park Royal in, uh, in Sydney near Darling Harbour then. Now, I also guest lecture at the um, Sydney Business School in the Executive MBA program there and in the MBA Masterclass at the Uni of Wollongong and a, lecture, a guest lecture in Sales and Marketing Collaboration and Alignment. And uh, I'm, I'm now finally allowed to say that for the first time, and I think this is an Australian first, for the first time um, we will have sales incorporated into the executive MBA program in, in the business school in Australia. And uh, this, this is um, starting with the intake um, this year. So exciting times because normally, believe it or not, sales has not featured in the MBA or the EMBA program at all. You know, it was a finance and marketing and strategy and all that sort of thing. But, uh, but the, 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 the function that brings in the dollars was kind of overlooked somehow and we've rectified that and it's, it's, it's a really good thing. Uh, I also have a, um, a, a LinkedIn group. It's called the Sales Plus Marketing Collaboration Community. You look it up on LinkedIn and uh, feel free to join in. It's a, it's a really cool community. It's uh, grown very quickly and we now have um, you know, over 2,500 members, I, I think, at last count. Um, I'm, I'm a speaker. Uh, I MC conferences. So for example, I'm speaking at the um, Custom Experience Management um, Forum in Sydney on Wednesday of next week and that's a three-day conference that I'm emceeing as well I'm speaking at and uh, I'm also an executive mentor and coach. So if you need some mentoring or coaching, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. All right, so that's enough about me. Let's uh, look at what the changes have been over the last 10 years in sales and marketing. Now, anyone that's um, been buying stuff over the last 10 years will know or actually been selling stuff over the last 10 years will know that um, things have changed quite a bit and that increasingly the boundaries between sales and marketing are, are blurring and that we're trying to fix the blurring and the, the, the new changes and the distinctions that, that we're making with um, technology. Now, if, if you look at the three cogs that I've drawn up here, we have a very strong 
um, preference for starting off with the people, getting the people to agree that they want to work together, then getting them to agree how they want to work together now that they're actually talking to each other, and, uh, and then we support all that with technology. Now, I just uh, recently published a blog, I think it was two or three weeks ago, um, where I said, you know, is business technology and, and um, CRM in particular, you know, customer relationship management software in particular, is that implemented the wrong way around? You know, do we start off with the technology and then hope that the people will use it? Or should we just really get the people involved, get them to agree that, that's, that the, the, the technology is a good thing and that they will actually benefit from using it, and then roll out the technology after they've agreed to it. Um, at the moment, it seems to me that uh, we get fascinated with the technology, we implement it, and there's, there's an edict on the um, implementation team to install it on time and on budget, but there's no mention of um, realizing the business benefits that the software or, or the technology is meant to be delivering to the organization in the first place. And um, and then when it hits the end users, the, the people that actually have to operate the software, um, they find that uh, they're not as accepting of, of it as, as one would hope. And um, usually with these things, there is an expectation on um, uptake and utilization of the, of the new technology. And, uh, and very often these uh, expectations are disappointed because the people weren't on board when the technology came, came along. So, I'm a very strong um, believer that technology is a, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But just the way that we go about implementing it and, and bringing it to the people is, uh, in, in my opinion, not fantastic. I think we can, we can do a lot better. So if, if you're interested, uh, go and have a look uh, at my LinkedIn profile and, and uh, all my publications there. Um, there that, that's where I do my blogging. Right. So the point is that uh, we still need people. And we want the people to want to use the technology and want to agree. Um, we want them to agree on processes with each other. And so we need a holistic approach that encompasses people, process, and technology, but in that order of priority and sequence. So the people first, processes second, and the technology third. By the way, if you disagree with me, just uh, feel free to type in, and uh, we'll have a little discussion about that. All right. I want to come to something. Um, slightly related. Here's a, um, a Google report on how many searches have occurred over the last uh, five years. Um, actually, for the last uh, 10 years nearly, um, in the terms advertising and marketing. So how many times over the last 10 years has the term advertising or marketing featured in Google searches? And the thing that's uh, quite you know, obvious here is that the trend is going down. The interesting thing is, what happens if we put the word digital in front of advertising and marketing? Right? And you can see, traditional marketing and advertising is slowing down, but digital is booming. Yeah? If you look at uh, the, the blue graph here for digital marketing, you can see that's really taking off, um, even more so than, than content marketing, which is the the new kid on the block in terms of um, sales and marketing relationships is concerned. So interesting is the interesting thing is that um, digital is taking off, and the old analog way is um, kind of dying, slowly dying out, or not becoming as important as it was before. That is also reflected in digital marketing budgets. So you can see over the last four years, um, we've had the budgets going up quite a bit, and they've almost tripled since 2009. And we haven't got the, obviously haven't got the 2015 big figure yet, but we'll expect when that comes out, it'll be closer to the 50% mark, that 50% uh, of the budget will be digital. And, um, and uh, you know, it'll be on par with the, um, with the analog marketing budget. OK, now here is a bit of a consequence um, of all this this um, this change that's going on. This is a report from the Fournay's Marketing Group in the UK, and they simply asked CEOs, how happy are you with your marketing people or with your marketing team? And unfortunately, they said 70% of, of the CEOs said that they were not happy with their marketers, which is a, a, a phenomenal figure, you know? 
if you'd say 30% you go, okay, well, there might be some bad eggs there, but but 70% of marketers were not living up to the expectations of their CEOs. Now, how can we interpret that? So either the marketers weren't doing what they're meant to be doing, or maybe the expectations of the CEOs are a bit unrealistic. And if you look at the second paragraph there, the CEOs were expecting more leads that are sales ready to being delivered to the salespeople from the marketing team. They wanted the salespeople to be enabled to grow more market share and to grow the revenue. Okay. Now, if you think about it really hard, you'll find that none of these are really marketing outcomes. Right? Because marketing is, is meant to be um, helping with the brand recognition and, and the profile and the thought leadership and the um, um, you know, positioning in the, in the marketplace and, and you know, basically help the sales force to make a sale, but it's not meant to really make the sale for the sales force. So um, I have a bit of a concern over this, this survey because the if the CEOs really think that the marketing is there to create more revenue, then um, I, I think we have a, a bit of a disconnect uh, there in the first place. Uh, um, now, get, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that marketing is not there to help sales. It absolutely is. But, um, you know, the marketing people are not selling, so they, they can hardly be held accountable for, for revenue. Um, but there is a lot of um, debate at the moment about lead generation, lead management, lead uh, nurturing and, uh, and handing over um, to the point where we've, we've got all these uh, three-letter acronyms now of uh, marketing generated lead leads, so um, MGLs, and sales accepted leads, SALs, and um, marketing qualified leads, MQLs, and, and, and so on. So um, there is a whole lot of um, technology in terms of marketing automation and Salesforce automation systems going in where marketing is meant to create the leads, distribute them to sales, and then sales follow them up. And there is an expectation of what those leads should look like and what the um, what the quality of those should be, uh, and and that that's a whole different subject again. Now, when we talk about the disconnect between sales and marketing, and we'll come to marketing soon, I, I promise. Um, we, it's not just us talking about uh, the disconnect. If if you look at these two papers here, even way back in 2007, Gartner put out a paper saying that marketing and sales working together is a good thing. You know, and uh, and they, they they wrote the whole paper on that, and uh, and you know you can you can still look it up. It's available online. The thing that really um, surprised me was there's there's a paper by the ha uh, Harvard Business Review, out, um, which uh, three prominent marketers have written, and including Neil Rackham. And Neil Rackham, he's pictured here, is the founder of Spin Selling. You know, so he invented spin selling methodology, and and uh, the, the reason I've got him pictured here is he, he's a bit of a personal hero of mine because he actually went um, about finding out about spin or developing spin in a, in a quite a scientific way. So he did a lot of work with very large organisations. Uh, um, Fuji Xerox, um, uh, Xerox um, Corp was one of them, and he studied the behaviour of the salespeople to find out why are the good ones good and the bad ones bad. And, and he found some, some common traits amongst the good ones and, uh, and he, that helped him to develop the, the spin selling methodology. So, so he's a bit of a legend in, in, the, in the sales game. And for these three prominent experts to call their book or, or their paper ending the war between sales and marketing, so they're not calling it a disconnect or a conflict or a you know, gap, they're calling it a war. There's hardly a stronger word you can use for, for a relationship between two um, groups of people. Um, so that that um, really surprised me and, and made me think that there is probably something to it that um, that is worth looking into. And uh, so that, that helped me to, with my inspiration, to, to um, develop the, the one team method to help them work together again as one team. So sales and marketing, collaborating. Now, we're not alone in this because if you look at a study um, on from based from uh, 2013 now, um, they said, what, um, 
in the coming year, so 2014, what um, initiatives will your company be undertaking to improve sales performance? And there's a whole bunch of uh, options uh, given there. And the one that got the most was enhancing lead generation. So we've, we've talked about that, that uh, more leads is good. Um, I, I'm not quite a strong believer in saying more leads is good. I'm, I'm a strong believer in saying better leads, high quality leads is good. But that's um, a different discussion again. But number two was aligning sales and marketing. So what does that tell us? It tells us that sales and marketing are not aligned and that they need aligning and, uh, and you know, there's um, uh, special ways to go about it. So it's a popular thing. It's hot. It's a hot subject. And the, there's a recognition that um, aligning sales and marketing brings business benefits. So this is where you come in. I'm going to ask you to just type in whether you're sales or marketing or something else. I'll, I'll just give you a minute to do that. Can you please type, just type in sales or marketing or else? I think it seems to be quite an even split there, but we also have some people in events as well, Peter. We also have people in events. So that, this is great. Dominica, um, you're else and sales and marketing. You're everything. That, that's fantastic. And and um, Angela is the sales and marketing director. And, and actually, I'll, I'll um, talk about our research in a minute, but the, um, the thing that we found was really effective was that if sales and marketing reported to one head who then reported to the CEO was much more effective than having a separate head of sales and a separate head of marketing who then independently from each other report to the, um, to the CEO. They were much more successful than that. So, so this is great. So we've got um, both sales and marketing well represented, which means that we're all ready for the next question, which is how well do you think your sales and marketing teams are working together? So if you uh, the question is a bit loaded by saying seamlessly, you know, but but I'll I'll change it slightly by by could you just say um, yes, no, okay, not really well, you know, just give it your own spin. I'll I'll just give you a minute. So it looks like I see a lot of um, room for improve, improvement. Um, I, gu I guess that's not really a, um, a surprise because if everything was hunky-dory, you wouldn't be in this webinar. So um, that's probably a reflection of, um, of you being here as well. So that, now let's have a look at why that is and, and why you're not alone. Here's a, a collection of um, statistics from around the world on sales and marketing collaboration and I'll be stepping just through them. So CSO Insights is a, um, a US-based um, think tank, and they did, did um, some research, and it says that less than a third of a sales rep's time is spent on actual selling. Now, I run a um, executive um, roundtable group in, in Sydney, where we get uh, senior executives from, from various industries together and we talk about the sales and marketing collaboration and, and you know, how it's working in their organization and, and, and not and you know, what could be done. The, the point is that they all tell me 35% is a very high number. They're saying in, in Sydney, or certainly in, in, in Sydney if not in Australia, um, they, it's less than 20% of the sales rep's time is actually spent selling and, and we, for this purpose of the exercise, we um, 
we define selling as actual communication with a prospect. So whether that's online, um, on phone, on Skype, or face-to-face, -face, doesn't matter, but actual direct communication with a prospect, um, we say it's less than 20% of their time is spent doing that. Um, and that's what we're talking about, the sales website. Can I just ask you if anybody disagrees with that figure in their organization? Thank you. OK, so what would it mean if we could improve on that? What if we freed up the time you know, from 30% and give, gave them an extra 15% and made it 50%? Um, so an extra 15% of selling time. If, if we take the um, take a nice round figure and make it a hundred million dollar organization, then that extra 15% would translate into you guessed it 15 million dollars in revenue, and let's say they have a 30% profit margin that would translate to another four and a half million in to the bottom line, simply by freeing up the sales reps to um, to be given more time spending in front of a client. Um, now. Julia is asking, does this statistic include driving time? It, it does not. The, the statistic is meant to convey actual time spent with the prospect, like I said, either face-to-face -face or online or in, on Skype or, or, or sending them an email. Um, direct client interaction, not, not driving, Julia. But it's a good question. Thank you for that. The next one is about content creation. 42%, according to BrainShark, another US think tank, say that 40% um, of sales reps say that marketing does not or very rarely involve them in the creation of content, of new content. So it's it's very often the case that I, that I have also seen, and that is that at times marketing creates content and collateral and brochures and pamphlets and, and kind of I don't want to be unkind to the marketers, but kind of throws it over the fence to sales and, and kind of says that that's our job done. Now you guys go and use this and sell. And the, and the sales people kind of go, well, it's not really quite what I need and um, and therefore maybe I might make my own. And uh, and that creates a problem then that uh, sales people are spending their time not doing selling, but trying to do marketing and, and when marketing is really meant to be doing uh, the marketing. So what could we do? Um, to remedy that, I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, here's a statistic. This is from our own research. This is 185 B2B organizations um, over um, a 2013-14 period. And we asked the reps simply, how much of your time do you spend either looking for or modifying marketing content? And the numbers were quite surprising. So you can see there that uh, quite a few, about a third, say I spend less than 10% of my time doing that, which is great because you, you want them to find the content quickly and you don't want them to muck around spending too much time modifying the content. But well over a third say they spend between 10 and 20% 10 and of their time and, and um, almost another third said um, we, we spent um, 20 to 30 percent of our time looking for and modifying content. Now, if, if you take the two middle bars together, that's that's half the workforce, half the sales force is spending between 10 and 30 percent of the time looking for or modifying marketing content. So, you know, if if you go back to how much of the time does a sales rep spend selling, it could be an explanation why they're not spending more of the time selling. So the the corollary of that is that if we give them more time by helping them to find the content that they need when they need it, then that would be um, supporting them much better. The the other sad statistic, this is from, from IDC, which is an international um, um, research house and consulting firm. Now, now they say only 25% of the sales leads and the collateral that marketing creates is ever used by sales teams. Now, I find that an incredible figure, 25%. That means that 75% does not get used. And, and you know, that's acceptable. I, I just really find that really weird. But um, I might just give you a chance to type in here whether, you know, what do you think of that figure in, in your own organization?
Okay, so I, I think we're largely agreeing that it's a low figure. And I think we need to qualify it a little bit by saying that there's a lot of content that marketing creates that's not meant to be used as a sales tool. Right? There, there's uh, all the thought leadership pieces and there's the, 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 all the information that goes up on the website. And um, you know, so it's probably not fair to say that 100% of the, of the marketing collateral should be used um, in the sales process. So I think we have to temper that figure with, um, with that knowledge as well. But uh, I agree with the, with the majority of you that 25% does seem very low. And it highlights to me that there's not a lot of feedback going back from the sales people to the marketing people saying, how could your collateral be improved and how could it support me better? So here's a hypothetical. So if we say that we created a feedback loop between sales and marketing so that marketing could actually be informed by, by, by sales of not only what do they use but how could um, how could it be improved, then marketing wouldn't uh, need to guess what actually works for sales and they could make much better informed decisions in terms of how can they better support Salesforce. And, um, and uh, everybody would be happy because marketing could focus on marketing and sales could be focusing on, on, on selling and, uh, and each of them would use their own, um, their own uh, competency to, to improve the other and it would be a wonderful thing. And here's the, the bugbear of every um, sales manager and, and uh, CFO and CEO. And this is that um, two-thirds of sales reps do not achieve their personal sales quota. Now, I have to say this is an American statistic. I'm not sure that this applies to Australia as well. But um, let's just say it's a large number that they do not. And in the discussion round that I mentioned earlier with the executives, um, we were actually talking about why is that the case. And, and they largely agreed that um, a lot of reps don't don't make the number, and it's for two reasons. One, one is, well, probably more than two reasons, but one is that the, um, it may be that the reps are not, um, you know, as proficient as, at, at selling as, as they could be, um, but the flip side is also that maybe the numbers are not achievable and maybe they're not realistic. And I, I have seen this in, in very large organizations that um, the, the budget is developed and is sent up from the regional head office to the to the global head office, and the global head office says, "No, these numbers are not good enough. Do them again. Come up with something better." And this goes on a couple of times, and then in the end, the the regional sales office, so in, in our case, the Australian sales office, um, will put something up that they pretty much know is is a, is a big stretch, and um, that gets passed on to the salespeople. So I, I kind of feel for the salespeople that have these budgets imposed on them um, because it must be very um, frustrating at, at times. I'll just give me a moment to read the, the questions here. Layla's asking a question and she says, it's about how you communicate the feedback in a way that marketing would actually listen and apply. Um, so Layla, you've, you've hit the nail on the head it's got to be a two-way thing, right? So the, the feedback has to be given and the feedback has to be received and it has to be responded to and, and otherwise the feedback will stop very quickly. So I'll, I'll come to that um, uh, a bit, bit further in the, in the webinar. So if we just look mathematically at the, um, at the problem of um, sales reps not achieving the targets, we could get marketing to better support the sales reps so that they actually perform slightly better. So for example, if they are more competent at selling because they have um, subject matter expertise um, or they have um, a white paper that uh, will give them a foot in the door to the, the C-suite, so the, the CEO, the C CFO, the CMO um, of an organization, then um, they might be able to close more deals and they might be able to achieve more of their targets. So if we just said that um, we'll say that 50% um, now achieve their targets, then again for a $100 million hypothetical organization it would mean an additional $17 million in revenue and at 30% margin 
$4 million in profit. So you can, you can see they're not small numbers just for a small improvement in the support of the sales force by marketing. So this is kind of what we're talking about when we when we come to, to marketing. And I just want to mention um, the research that we did uh, in 2014, and we're currently, sorry, that we published in 2014, and we're currently working on the 2015 edition of this paper. It should come out um, probably in a couple of months, probably in the May time frame as well. But um, I want to, sh and it's, um, this, this paper is available free of charge on my website at uh, peterstrackofconsulting.com. And I just want to show you one of the findings, probably, probably the key finding. Now, don't worry that you can't read all this. Um, it's, it's not really about the text. It's more about the image. What we did here was we asked sales and marketing people separately about 14 different processes that should be in place. So, so let me start again. There should be four, we recommend that there are 14 different um, um, processes in place between sales and marketing to help them be aligned and to help them to collaborate. We asked them, uh, each one of these 14, we asked them, do you have this in place in your organization, yes or no? And the, the way the graph can be interpreted is that the more the, the gray and the orange lines meet in the middle, the more they are aligned and the more they agree that they have these things in place. Okay. So the graph on the left shows the result for organizations whose revenue grew over the preceding 12-month period versus the one on the right where um, the revenue either stagnated or went backwards. Now, you can see in pretty much one glance that the lines meet much more evenly in the middle for the growth organizations than for the non-growth organizations. And, um, and that's kind of a key finding of, of the research, namely that there's a, 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 direct, a direct relationship between sales and marketing alignment and collaboration and the financial success of an organization. I mentioned that we're currently working on the 2015 paper. So here's a little glance at it, a, a preview. If we analyze those figures further, we find that you're actually twice as likely to be financially successful if, you, if your sales and marketing teams are aligned. Or it means, if you, if you flip it around, it means that um, your risk doubles if they're not aligned. Your risk of um, financial performance not hit, not uh, um, going forward, not going, not going, being positive, doubles. The risk doubles um, with less collaborative organisations. So um, there's a strong case to be made for sales and marketing working together and uh, and becoming marketing. So this is kind of saying the same thing, that uh, the, the poorer the co collaboration or, or the worse the collaboration between sales and marketing, the poorer the sales of revenue and profit performance of the organization. Um, but the good news was that um, the more they worked together, the more successful the organization was as well in terms of financial um, results. So what, what do we say should happen? If you look at this graph, we have um, sales speaking to the customer in terms of their sales engagement, and we have marketing talking to the customer through you know, um, the, web, uh, the, the website, um, collateral, thought leadership pieces, white papers, um, conferences, um, trade shows, etc. But if the communication between sales and marketing is not as fantastic as it could be, the risk is that the customer will hear two different things. And if you know about the um, the buyer's journey, so this 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 is um, the old sales cycle has uh, given way to the buyer's journey. And what it means is that a lot of buyers go online first these days, inform themselves of, of, about what they can have, who they can get it from, and what price they should pay, and only then are they ready to to contact the sales rep. 
So from the sales rep's perspective, that means that by the time the buyer is contacting you, they've already made up their mind, and it's going to be pretty hard for the rep to go and change them, uh, upsell them to something else, or, or, or um, um, sorry, sell them something else, or upsell them um, some additional bid, because they've already done their research and know exactly what they want, they know what they can buy it for, and uh, and who who do you get it from, and that if you don't sell it to them, then there's uh, two or three others they can. So the, the important thing in the buyer's journey is that we get sales and marketing having a consistent message to the customer so that when the buyer moves away from the buyer's journey into direct contact with the organization and they actually want to talk to a rep, that the messaging remains consistent. That there's nothing much uh, scarier than for a buyer than reading something online and, and being uh, made to feel confident that the organization is, uh, is, is capable of uh, supplying what I need and then contacting a rep and uh, them telling them something different. And, and because they have a choice to walk away, they will walk away. So it's, it's absolutely important that we have sales and marketing talking to each other and singing from the same hymn sheet to, to the customer. So what that means then is that we've got to come back to the to the three um, cogs that I talked about earlier. That in order to get people to collaborate, we've got to start with the people domain. Right? So we've got to get the people to agree that they want to work together, and we do that through um, a, a, a range of um, um, assessments, seminars, surveys, and workshops, and basically get them to understand. Firstly, that they're different, sales and marketing. Secondly, how they're different. And then we, we move on and say, it's OK. It's OK that you're different, because you're both doing different things. But if you just could work together, it would be so much better for everybody else. right? So the principle is that we want sales to be enabled to provide constructive feedback to marketing on the support that marketing is giving sales. And we're talking about your sales leads, your collateral, your you know, content, your thought leadership pieces, your white papers, the website content and everything. So we want sales to be empowered to speak out and say, look, this, this really works for us, this doesn't work for us, um, we, we don't use this, this stuff at all, and we, we find this, this other stuff is really great. But as I said earlier, if the feedback was just one way, and marketing wouldn't respond to the feedback, then the feedback would pretty much stop very quickly and we would be back to square one. So what absolutely must happen is that marketing responds to the feedback and says, thank you very much, sales, for, for the feedback that you've given us, good and bad, positive and negative, and constructive and otherwise. And we will, we will respond to that, and here's what we're going to do with it. Okay? So the, the benefit for sales is that not only are they empowered to, to provide the feedback, but they're also getting information back from marketing in terms of what's going to happen, and they can see and they see that stuff happens when they actually feed um, the information back to marketing. So we, we call this a, a, a collaborative cycle, a, a, a cycle of commu a collaboration, a, a virtuous cycle of collaboration. I got it now, and um, and basically whereby sales helps marketing, so that marketing can help sales and everybody uses their own competency to achieve that objective. Now, where does that leave the customer in all this? So, so firstly, if sales and marketing talk to each other and, and align their, their messaging, then the message uh, going back to the market is going to be consistent, no matter whether they're going to be online or face-to-face -face with a sales rep. So that, that's a great benefit. But what we can also do is we can actually include the customer in that feedback mechanism, and, and that's, that's something that my firm does. So we actually go and interview the customers about what do they, how is their marketing and sales effort of the organization perceived at the customer end. And you know we come in kind of as Switzerland, uh, as a neutral entity, and we anonymize everything. So that means that they can tell us exactly what they think, and they won't get into trouble, and no, nobody will know who said what. But the information, the very valuable information, goes back to the vendor organization, and they can actually make a much more in informed decision uh, next time of, um, about how they present to the market and uh, what, um, what, what methods they will use and what messaging they will, will, 
will do. And uh, and I have to say, the, the the reaction from the customers is usually very positive. Um, and it, it, they often say to us things like, "Ooh, these guys really care about us, don't they?" You know, that they, they engage you to to find out what we really think. And and the reason that they would engage us to find out what they really think is because the customer would not tell the sales rep directly what they really think. You know, there's there's too much at stake there, and uh, and and to do it in a, in a in a you know confronting or face to face way is, is not something that everybody's comfortable with. But if it's anonymized and it's it's uh, generalized and it goes through a third party, then it's kind of okay to say, well, look, their their service sucks and you know, they could do this better. Or they could say, we really love this thing that they do for us. That's really fantastic, and I wish they'd do more. So either way, it's good information for the vendor to have because then, then they can um, uh, improve their ways with the client. So the um, the thing is that we, we can have collaboration between sales and marketing and, and with the customer as well. All right. So I promised I was going to talk about what's in it for you. And here's some financial um, figures that we have found um, work when you combine sales and marketing into marketing. And we're talking about a big increase in revenue, uh, commensurate increase in, in gross profit, the not just the lead generation, but also the lead conversion rate. And also, if we have all the information that we need in one place where people can find it, where can find what they need when they need it, we can reduce the time a new rep takes to come up to um, to full speed, and and that's um, worth um, something in dollar terms as well. Now we usually provide a financial modeling service for our clients so that they can actually put in their own numbers and we can um, um, model four or five different uh, scenarios around that. I'm not going to do that here today, but what I am going to show you is just one sample calculation. Right? And this is based on uh, a couple of people from the Harvard Business School in the, in the 90s, and they, they discovered this phenomenon that if you increase a salesperson's productivity by just 5%, you can increase the profitability by 20%. So what they call it is, is they call it a, a four times profit lever. Now, that for those of you um, who think this is a bit extraordinary, I'm going to show it to you. So let's say we have an organization and we sell something for $100. The thing that we're selling for $100 costs us $60, so that leaves us with $40 gross profit. Then we have fixed costs and admin costs and direct selling expenses and uh, um, um, and you know, other, other expenses in there. So let's say the thing that we're selling for $100, we make a profit of $10 before tax on. All right, So we get a 10% um, profit margin there. Now let's look at three scenarios of what would happen if we started reducing the direct selling expenses by just 5%. So we're talking about, about a very Conservative figure, we're not talking about 10, 20, 30 percent, we're just talking about 5 percent. So let's say we want to reduce the direct selling expenses by 5 percent, or we want to improve the sales productivity by 5 percent, or we want to raise prices by 5 percent. So we've got three different scenarios here. And um, for those of you who are detailed minded, you can go through the individual lines, but if we look at the, the bottom um, end result, reducing the direct selling expenses by 5 percent brings only a 3% improvement in, in terms of profitability. Right? So, so all those salespeople who are hounded by their sales managers of uh, spending too much on a cup of coffee to take out your client, show them this figure and it's, uh, and it's not really worth arguing over. Right? Whereas what they should be talking to you about is how can you increase your sales volume by 5% or, or sell, so sell 5% more or sell 5% faster or sell 5% um, um, higher margin. Because that brings you 20% improvement for a 5% improvement on, in productivity. So here's your four times lever. Now also what this example shows in the far right column there is that if you increase your price by 5%, you can increase your profitability by 50%. And that might explain why your CFO or your financial controller or, or whoever is the, um, the financial person in the organization 
will always say, "Come on, come on! You can you can raise the price a bit more. You can get ask a bit more from your client." Yeah, because it does make a, a big difference um, to the profit uh, to the bottom line. But unfortunately, it's not always realistic, right? We we live in a world that that's um, hyper competitive, and if you if you increase your price by five percent, you you may not make the fifty percent uh, improvement. You may actually make zero percent improvement because you don't get the deal. So personally, I think raising the prices by five percent is probably not as realistic as increasing your sales productivity by five percent. But that is highly dependent on on the individual organisation, and I'm just hoping that this is um, helping you to understand that getting the sales productivity up by supporting the sales force better through the marketing activities actually makes a big difference to the organization. And, and so there, there's a, um, a fantastic opportunity for the marketers to put their hand up and say, I want to help my sales counterpart to do better. And are you on board with me? And what that does is, for the first time, um, you you won't be beaten up on the budget and on the um, you know on on what you're contributing to sales. You're actually taking the ball by the horns and you're you're being proactive and showing um, the CEO some leadership. And because it was your initiative and you said to the sales um, manager, "Are you with me?" It means that um, they have to be on board with you, but it's still your leadership showing through. So um, it, it's kind of like a, a, a really good career move and it's a win-win scenario and it would actually help the organization if, if it comes through. So I would encourage you to have a, a good look at these figures here and say, wow, that, that I can really make a contribution to those and I know how to do it. So um, there's, there's your, um, your tip for the day there. Now, <clears throat> if you want to see what this looks like for your own organization, you can actually go to my website and there is something that, that's called the ROI check. And you can put your own figures in, and you'll find that um, it'll give you the result in terms of if I improve my productivity by a percentage that you put in, say 5%, what would that look like for my organization? And, and I think you'd be surprised at the results. Um, just one, one uh, caveat there. The formula, the, the Harvard Business Review formula works the other way around as well. So if you don't achieve improvement in productivity, or if the productivity actually goes backwards, the numbers amplified the other way as well. So so you get a bigger loss um, in, the, in the same order of magnitude. So it's, it, it, it has a big negative impact if it goes backwards. So it's best to be proactive and um, and try to improve the, the, the current um, status quo. So I'm going to now open the floor to questions. Yep. And um, and also, what I would like you to do is to, to type in your questions and also to say what was good for you today. And, uh, and Sarah has very kindly put up a, um, a survey for you to fill in as well. So there's plenty of stuff for you to do. Ask questions. Tell me what uh, you thought was good for you today and um, fill in the survey. And I'll just um, be waiting for you to type things in. I think we might go um, to Layla's, Layla's question as well um, regarding what you were speaking about a few slides back. So she said, there is also the issue of timing. Sometimes by the time the changes have been made, so I'm thinking about uh, marketing material and collateral, it is time for another change. So how do we bridge the gap on timing? Yes, thank you, Leila. I saw that question. I didn't really have an opportunity to answer it. To me, it comes back to the quality of, uh, of communication. Um, so, so the quality of communication means how well do we communicate, but it also means how quickly do we communicate, right? And then how quickly do we respond? So if, if everything goes well in marketing, sales and marketing would be so aligned that uh, uh, they, they would not need to wait Firstly, they would not need to wait for a, for a problem to occur before they talk about it. But secondly, is once they do talk about it, they also have the ability to make a decision very quickly and to respond to it very quickly. So um, absolutely, if, if you improve the collaboration between sales and marketing, and, and if that improves the 
level of communication and the quality of communication, then it should be able to respond to these changes much more quickly and, and what's important, much more quickly quickly with a um, an agreed um, um, with, with an agreed um, um, set of steps with an uh, agreed action and um, you know it, it comes back to, to communication the quality of it and, and 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 the speed of response but if marketing works all this should be in place does that answer your question Leila? Great. I can't see any more questions coming through, um, but what you might do on the follow-up email that will be sent out in, along with the recording and the PowerPoint presentation, uh, well, is it okay if we put your direct details on there, Peter, for people to contact you? Should they have any other questions about today? Yep, absolutely. Now, if, you, if you're still keen, um, I'm interested to find out what, what part of the presentation was actually good for you. So uh, if, if you have any comments, um, feel free to type those in as well. Um, otherwise, we'll um, leave you to the, uh, to the survey. Yep, excellent. And thank you for everyone completing that. Um, and thank you once again for everyone joining our Business Skills Series. And a huge thank you uh, to you, Peter, for joining us today. Um, very, very, very inspirational um, insights there. And I'm sure everyone learned a thing or two that they can take away. Um, and hopefully make a huge impact um, or even a small impact to the bottom line. You never know. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for completing the survey and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks so much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.